Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you all very much for coming to Arundel House on a drizzly Monday uh, lunchtime for this discussion on uh, Changing Asia, a Japanese perspective on how to read Asia uh, today. Uh, some of you who are close followers of ISS publications may have seen the strategic dossier the Institute produced earlier this year, a regional security assessment with regard to Asia, and we did that in preparation for the Shangri-La Dialogue. And one of the key observations that came out of that was that the region is um, not only in flux, but in many senses uh, in a state of some uh, fragility. Flux because of the, uh, the redistribution uh, of power and all of uh, the uncertainties and ambiguities that go with that. Fragility in terms of the range of challenges and the limitations of capacity to deal with them all, whether it's uh, some of the political contests that we've seen uh, in Southeast Asia, whether it's the territorial disputes, whether it's uh, the rising tendency towards competitive military uh, dynamics, whether it's um, difficulties in the dealings that the great powers um, have with each other. And um, that, in a sense, uh, that publication was a curtain raiser for the Shangri-La Dialogue, in which we were pleased to welcome uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to give us uh, his perspective, uh, his view, his policy, really, on the principles and, and the practicalities on which Japan's policy towards uh, the Asia-Pacific is going to be based, and that generated a good deal uh, of reaction, not least from uh, from China, but from a number of other uh, countries as well. Some of it positive, some of it uh, less uh, enthusiastic, but I think we've all been struck by the degree to which the current administration in Japan, after a period of uh, relative um, economic stasis, and to some degree, a, de uh, a degree of absence really from the regional diplomatic stage has uh, launched itself on an uh, effort to really revivify uh, its diplomacy, uh, to develop uh, a strategy. And it's doing that uh, not only as an, a good end in itself, but also, of course, in response to some of the, uh, the issues and the trends that I alluded to before. So uh, we're very pleased to have uh, um, Ambassador Ikiro Fujisaki today. I wouldn't say that we're welcoming him, but that we're welcoming him back uh, because um, the ambassador has not only had a, a connection with the Institute through his official appointments uh, as somebody who's worked in uh, in London as a political counsellor, but because in 1997 and, sorry, 1987 and 1988, as we were just reminiscing, uh, he spent time here at the Institute as a as a research associate. I say here, not exactly here, because we then occupied an entirely uh, different building and we were just talking about some of the uh, rather powerful personalities <laughs> that were part of the ISS uh, universe uh, at that stage. Um, as I mentioned, had a very a distinguished a diplomatic career uh, involving um, latterly uh, the position of ambassador to the United States, clearly the, the, the pinnacle of, of any um, <coughs> foreign uh, service career officers uh, uh, projection. And since that time, he's also uh, uh, been dividing uh, his time between a number of distinguished academic assignments at uh, Sophia University and Keio University and heading up uh, the America Japan Society, Inc. So, very pleased that you're here. You'll talk for about uh, 20 minutes or so, and then some questions. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ward, for Dr. Ward, for having me and uh, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, being here in spite of this uh, weather, uh, maybe typical London weather. <laughs> I uh, uh, am very pleased to be here because uh, when I retired in uh, November 2012, I, on that day I said, now I can say anything. <laughs> and my friend said, but no one cares anymore, so uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, today, uh, I am happy, but uh, my wife is happy as well. Uh, when I said to her that I'm coming to IISS, uh, she said, that's good, Ichiro, that's very good. And I thought uh, she was happy for me because I'm coming back here after 25 years. Uh, at last as a speaker and uh, no that was not the case uh, she said we haven't paid the annual fee it's difficult to pay through it's we can't pay it through internet so why don't you go and pay it for this so uh, uh, I'm very happy about it as well yes. uh, you see uh, the world was a little 
a bit more euphoric uh, 20 years ago and uh, we thought uh, uh, emerging countries were pulling us our economy and uh, it's going to be a little bit more quiet and peaceful and the uh, uh, pandemic was only a theme of uh, 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 fiction story but it's not at all now it's not quiet look at Ukraine what's happening in Arab countries what's happening in s with the Islamic State I'm uh, sorry for uh, Mr. Alan Hennings uh, uh, passing away uh, now uh, uh, these uh, countries who looked a little more stronger is slowing down as well and pandemic we see that it is happening so uh, difficult. Now, how should we look at the situation? I think two things are clear. One is that uh, in spite of our expectations, some countries or group of people are resorting to use of force of violating human rights, which we thought would not happen in this way. That's one. Second, we can't cope with the situation just by one country alone. These are two things. In that case, what should happen is that like-minded countries should cooperate. That's a natural answer. But in order to do so, we should not be swayed by some wrong notion. We have to have a clear notion of wh where we are. And today, I'm trying to give uh, sort of challenge three notions of Japan, which some country people may have, and maybe I'm exaggerating. One is that uh, Japan is now going to rearm itself, uh, changing defense policy, revising the history, tilting more to the right, and the becoming a source of concern from some of the Asian some other Asian countries uh, uh, friends that is the first notion I'm going to talk about second notion Japan is concentrating on Asia Pacific its relations <coughs> with other countries in the region and not really a world uh, thinker or strategic thinker in terms of uh, global politics or economy. A third notion that I'm going to challenge is that Abenomics or Abe is trying to uh, bring back Japan to the right uh, real on economy but it's still frail and it's only on the surface that economy is doing well and it's not structural reform is <coughs> not really uh, in the projection. The first, let's start from the first one. Yes, uh, Japan has uh, initiated new policy like uh, establishing National Security uh, uh, Council, uh, trying to review export uh, of uh, arms and uh, also <coughs> change the interpretation of uh, right of collective self-defense. That has given some alarm to some people. However, important thing is that uh, Japan is not trying to go independent and uh, rearm itself at all. All these measures are taken in order to fortify relations with the United States. Japan's circumstance, environment, is not that quiet, even a little bit more difficult than before. North Korea is continuing it's uh, nuclear and uh, development and also missile tests to Japan Sea. China is uh, intruding into our uh, territorial sea and having some issues with other countries as well. It's not too quiet and US security assurance is really more important than before. For the first time maybe really people are thinking that extended deterrence is important. <coughs> In that, against that background, we have to realize that there's a war fatigue in the United States, having been fighting for 10 years. So what Japan is concerned is that we can't 
make the situation where ad administration is told by Congress and by people that why do we have to uh, defend Japan when Japan is not doing its homework? So that is exactly the reason that Japan is changing its defense policy in order to fortify the relations. And uh, that is uh, uh, clear from uh, 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 Mr. Obama's uh, statement uh, when he came to Japan in April. He said the uh, uh, United States welcomes and supports the uh, change of uh, uh, interpretation of coll collective defense and uh, United States uh, rebalance policy is uh, in line with the uh, uh, Japan's uh, policy of proactive uh, peace and so we are working together in that sense. Uh, the defense guideline that uh, uh, is going to be reviewed and uh, we have just uh, come up uh, a few days ago with the uh, interim report that says that we are trying to uh, uh, expand our cooperation on a global basis, on PKO, the sea, intelligence, and we work on cyber and space together, and uh, we will make a concrete scenario on uh, uh, a case of attack to Japan as well. Uh, as for Japan rearming, it, you know, Japan's uh, exp uh, uh, budget for defense budget has increased only 2.04 percent and 2.04 percent but uh, two percent of which is uh, for the uh, uh, cost of uh, the rise of salary and so it's not really uh, increasing yet and uh, it's compared uh, to compared for example China which has increased in 26 years to 4,000 percent and uh, in 10 years to 400 percent it's totally different scale uh, and uh, we are maintaining the policy not to have a offensive weapon like a bomber aircraft carrier or a long-range missile so uh, <coughs> all in all the essence is not changed very frankly I think uh, Mr. Abe wanted to give the uh, image that he's really going into the new arena, but in, and some countries around us may say that we are really changing the policy, but in very essence the basic philosophy remains. As for history, uh, there are, uh, uh, Japan has no intention of revising history or we look at World War II uh, or comfort women uh, those uh, policies that have been explained will be maintained and uh, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, there has been some uh, uh, misleading statements by some people or whatever and uh, we have given that impression but uh, it's uh, the deep remorse and apology that have been expressed by previous governments will be maintained, not revised at all. Uh, and uh, various sense of Japan's situation is, I think, exemplified by a, an article which appeared on Newsweek, 2010 August. I bought it. It says the best country in the world is uh, it says the top 10 countries in the world are Finland, Swiss, Sweden, Australia, Luxembourg, Norway, Canada, Holland, Japan, Denmark. But out of the populous country, big population country, the top 10 are Japan, US, Germany, UK, France, Italy, Mexico, Brazil, Russia, Turkey. I don't know how this, this is an international version and uh, uh, may, may, maybe this is a uh, uh, little bit out of your expectation that now it's out of print, Newsweek in English version, but uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, what I wanted to convey is that Japan is now a very, Japanese people in general are very happy with the status quo. They don't want to change the 
very basic status quo. Now, as for our relations with surrounding countries, uh, once Dr. Schmidt, uh, the uh, Chancellor, said Germany has a good relations with all the surrounding countries where Japan doesn't, I wanted to ask him, but do you have North Korea on your border? Uh, but uh, our relations with uh, uh, countries in Asia is not that bad, except for one or two. They made a research, we made a research in ASEAN seven countries. How, which country is the most reliable country in the world? Japan was 33. US 16, UK 6, China 5, Australia 5, fellow like that. And I have to admit that this research was done by Hong Kong company at the request of Jap Japanese government. So there could be some tilt, but uh, still it shows the broad picture uh, how they look at it. Now, uh, our relations with China it's a most important trading partner for us and uh, important investing country, so there's no reason the two countries have to antagonize. And uh, 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 it's very unfortunate that uh, we are, have some dispute over Ireland. And some people say that uh, we should go to a negotiating table on that. <coughs> But do you go to a negotiating table if you have peacefully governed that island for 100 years and suddenly asked to... I don't think UK has that history. You know what I'm talking about. See. Uh, and uh, as for uh, that uh, island issue, I think we can't compromise, but we should not uh, provocate as well, and we just uh, keep uh, uh, the status quo. And the problem is that uh, uh, there's not only uh, our issue, but there's a Vietnam-China uh, dispute, F Philippines-China dispute as well, in South China Sea. Uh, so all these issues have to be dealt with uh, rules and norms of law of the sea and other international rules. This is the most important thing. Uh, second issue of the fear to uh, concentrating on only on Asia Pacific and not uh, mindful about the rest of the world. If you go onto the street and ask the Japanese people in general, I think 60% of people knows Alex Salmond. 60% of people knows that 1707 was the country that uh, Scotland went to Great Britain. Everyone was so interested in your affair as well. People know about it. So, uh, Japan has been number two as a UN contributor for all this time. And uh, <laughs> our contribution is more than UK, uh, China, Russia added. and. Uh, we've been uh, taking very strong stance on uh, Ukraine issue. We can we said we, uh, this cannot be tolerated. We have conveyed that to uh, Mr. Putin and Mr. Lavrov directly. Uh, we in this world, uh, you can't change the uh, border with the use of force, and uh, we say that very strongly because we have the islands to defend as well. But we don't, of course, uh, close the door to any country. We've not closed the door to Iran. We have not closed the door to uh, Myanmar. We have not closed the door uh, at all to any country. That was the Japanese policy. Uh, and uh, as for uh, uh, Middle East, Japan has been the uh, number two contributor to Afghan and Iraq, next only to the United States, for nation building. And we've been uh, uh, 
supporting the fight with uh, in Islamic State. Uh, Prime Minister said uh, we'll extend the uh, 50 million emergency support and we have uh, uh, expressed this very clearly. Uh, as for Africa as well, we were the first country to start uh, Pan-Africa uh, Development Conference uh, called the Tokyo Initiative International uh, Conference on Africa. And uh, Ebola, we are uh, contributing as well. So we are not only concentrating on Asia Pacific, but uh, we'll try to be uh, a, uh, a continuing force for peace and stability in, Asia, uh, in the world. Lastly, Japan's economy. There's a notion that Japan is, uh, was under deflation for 20 years the last two generations. A lot of Japanese leaders say that too. However, I think there's a bit of exaggeration myself because uh, from 2003 to 2007, five years, our GDP growth was about 2%. It was about the same as Eurozone. And uh, not that different from United States was 2.9%. And uh, uh, however, on 2008, there was a Wall Street crash, Japan was hit most. Japan was not the starting point, but Japan was hit most. Our industrial output went down by 22%, export went down by 33%, and GDP went down by 5.5%. Why? Because Japanese product was something you can wait to buy. It's not uh, 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 something like uh, wheat or whatever meat. Uh, automobile or camera you can wait to buy so Japanese was hit most by Wall Street crash and then we started to grow in 2010 and on 2011 uh, earthquake tsunami came so it's not only because of uh, these uh, disasters on external uh, reasons but it was not that bad all the way I think uh, people are exaggerating that a bit but Abe san was uh, very clever uh, when he came in and uh, he changed the psychology by his three arrows. Uh, this uh, three arrows uh, economist uh, had on. Um, do you know why he used the word three arrows? Uh, it's because uh, uh, some uh, 400 years ago, uh, what time uh, lord, samurai lord, uh, invited uh, three sons in his dying bed and said uh, if uh, you try to break one arrow and it was easy to break it and then he bundled three together no one was able to break it so he said three arrows to three sons you stick together uh, and that's why he used the three arrow and uh, this uh, monetary policy fiscal policy and structural reform it has to go together of course he started with monetary and fiscal and now structural reform is going to be coming <coughs> structural reform is not so easy as to be said uh, because it uh, there's a rock hard uh, restrictions uh, but uh, starting already on agriculture medical and other areas uh, with using uh, special economic zone as well. Special economic zones uh, would cover about 30% of our GDP, so it's, it's not that small. It's uh, six zones, but uh, it covers 30% of GDP. And uh, it's coming, so we hope that uh, we will be uh, uh, coming along. Uh, Abesan has uh, expressed two times in Guildhall, uh, this time in May as well, and uh, that's a very strong statement he made. We still have challenges, TPP, EPA with Europe, uh, if we are to raise consumption tax from 8 to 10. Uh, uh, the, uh, we have an aging society, which is uh, quite a big issue because our birth rate is 1.3, uh, between 1.3 and 4, and uh, quickly uh, de decreasing uh, population, and uh, we, uh, for that we have to use more women's power and the GPIF 
the government pension investment fund has to be re reformed as well. We're going to lower our corporate tax to uh, lower, th uh, lower than 30 percent, and these are all challenges we are going to be facing very soon. And also, there's the nuclear power plant. How to start it? We had uh, 54 nuclear power plants. Uh, that was number three in the world, and uh, uh, zero now operating. And it's uh, very expensive to uh, use uh, uh, natural gas. So this is uh, uh, the challenge we have to do. Uh, now, uh, out of 54, 20 is now applying for the restart, and two has uh, been approved. Uh, now. They have to discuss with the local authority, but uh, uh, it will be coming along. And uh, uh, all in all, in today's world, I think Japan is aiming at two things, on politics and security. We are aiming at stability. No change by use of force. Stability is the key word. On economy, on the contrary, change and growth. And that is what uh, we will be doing and for the world. If Japan is to grow, uh, that is uh, that we are going to provide market as well. So uh, we would like to uh, cooperate with the UK and other countries. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, that we are now speaking about uh, this situation is because uh, we were helped so much during uh, 311, three and a half years ago. I was uh, abroad in Washington, but I hear that the people in UK, people elsewhere, has helped us a lot. And uh, without that help and friendship, we could not have come back to this stage. So, uh, in the end, I would express my gratitude. Thank you very much. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you. So we have some time for questions and uh, comments now. Maybe I can just kick things off by asking you to reflect a little bit on one of the more striking elements of the RB administration's regional diplomacy to date, which has been this extraordinary alignment with, uh, with India. There seems to be a tremendous personal affinity between uh, Prime Minister Abe and Prime Minister Modi. Uh, clearly, they both see each other as... Uh, economic modernizers with significant challenge ahead and a, and a similar philosophy. Um, but there does also seem to be a foreign policy and a, and a security dimension to this mutual attraction, um, which is, I suppose, not stated very publicly or, or, or at all, but where China seems to loom very large in the preoccupations of, uh, of both countries. I just wondered if you could say um, how much mileage you think there is in that bilateral relationship and how it might uh, evolve. I personally think that uh, India and Japan is nothing very new, uh, very frankly. It was started uh, more than 10 years ago uh, under Koizumi government, where abe -san was Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we were number one donors of uh, uh, ODA already at that time, <coughs> and it continued all the way. So, uh, very frankly, it's nothing new. But as for the personal chemistry uh, you have just mentioned, it seems very strong. Uh, he has with the Australian Prime Minister and uh, Indian Prime Minister. But uh, our attaching importance to India is all the way. Uh, uh, and uh, it sometimes gets more highlight when the Prime Minister visits or mm. it comes or is he, his mm -hmm. first time on the military parade and things like that. But. Uh, the second thing uh, comes from the uh, first point. Th there's no uh, logic or intention. I'm not, I'm not a diplomat anymore, so I'm not making a diplomatic comment, but uh, of trying to encircle China. Uh, there are some people who would like to say in, the, in those terms, but uh, and you carefully did not use that and use a Chinese loom over whatever. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we have to be very careful in uh, not giving an impression to our dear Chinese colleagues that we are trying to do that because, uh, as I said, China is our number one trading partner, number four invest 
and it's far bigger in that terms than India. And it's, uh, it, of course, India is important coming back, back but uh, China is to us is uh, 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 from uh, geographical terms uh, uh, next to each other, our history, uh, uh, culture, our e economic relations is far more stronger. Thank you. Uh, Mark Fitzpatrick, please. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador Fujisagi, for a very uh, clear exposition. With regard to the first uh, point, I'm Mark Fitzpatrick, Senior Fellow here for Non-Proliferation. You said that uh, U.S. security assurances are more important than before. You didn't say than ever before, but anyway, than before. And I said people feel it that way, yes. I'm wondering if you can, um, the two points, two questions, if you could explain maybe why they feel that way, <coughs> what are the circumstances that lead them to feel that way. And secondly, whether one hears in Tokyo like one hears in some places in the world, some doubts raised about the credibility of the American extended deterrence, you know, after the Syria chemical weapons red line was not honored, after uh, Putin seized the Crimea without any uh, strong uh, response. Two examples which I personally think are irrelevant to the case since Japan is an ally and they are not allies, but still, does one hear such doubts about credibility raised? Um. <coughs> As for uh, the people's thinking, I think uh, uh, this has been become stronger with the, uh, this uh, uh, North Korean uh, missile flying over our island, uh, meaning uh, the main island of Japan, and Chinese coming into our territorial sea. I think these have. Uh, uh, fortified uh, people uh, have uh, enhanced people's thinking that uh, deterrence is more important. And uh, as for the uh, credibility to uh, that extended deterrence, I am telling uh, people that, as you have rightly said, uh, with Syria or Ukraine, they didn't have alliance uh, uh, commit. U.S. didn't have a commitment, security commitment, alliance commitment. But with us, United States have it, has it. And if U.S. doesn't honor that <coughs> commitment, which is the strongest uh, commitment U.S. has with any uh, United uh, Asian countries, who will believe United States anymore? So that is the end of the credibility of United States if U.S. Don't, doesn't honor it. So uh, you don't have to worry about it. And I, I, am I wrong, sir? No, I, I agree with you. Just trying to get it down. <laughs> so, so, and uh, I am telling uh, Americans, uh, friends, that uh, security policy of United uh, of Japan. Uh, depends a lot on the United States credibility. If U.S. is uh, people deem credible, then uh, we think uh, we can continue our security policy. Uh, it's Masato Kimura, Japanese journalist based in London. And my question is about Chinese uh, peaceful rising theory. And so, uh, in the next uh, 10 years, the China economy will expand more, uh, maybe 10 times than Japanese economy. And uh, so, if they hope, uh, they can buy everything, uh, industry and, uh, for example, Tokyo or Ginza Street, they can buy a uh, Ginza in the story. And so uh, how do you think uh, China can change their mind so they can buy everything without force? You know, it sounds like uh, what uh, American friends were saying about Japan 20 years ago, uh, uh, like uh, Rockefeller Center or French winery and all that. Uh, by the way, uh, I was at a seminar uh, two weeks ago. There, our prime minister, former prime minister Fukuda, spoke, and I think that was a very interesting statement. He said, uh, right after Russo-Japan War, uh, a Japanese professor at Yale University wrote a book, warning Japan 
that Japan is becoming little too self-righteous uh, and uh, self-confident. American public uh, government doesn't like it. And the Japanese didn't hear about it in 30 years ago when war with the uh, United States. Uh, after the war, uh, Japan went into bubble economy and became arrogant again. And people were concerned uh, about the Japanese buying up everything. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, Chinese friends always talk about uh, learning from history. Please learn from our history. If you go a little too much, uh, people will not tolerate that. And I think that was a very good uh, suggestion. But he's a very good friend of China. He met Xi Jinping uh, only a month ago. But uh, he was telling that to, in front of to Chinese people. And I thought that was a very good uh, suggestion. I think uh, it, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if China is smart, and I think they are, they will not do such tangible thing as we have done and we have stumbled. So in that meeting, uh, Mr. Ishiba said, uh, so China should run from the uh, before wartime history, and Fukuda said uh, the China should run from uh, bubble age. And so what do you think? Which no, 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 he no, he said both, uh, Fukuda -san said both. Mm -hmm. He said after Russo Japan war, Japan became a little too arrogant. So uh, he warned, but uh, then uh, uh, this is. Uh, uh, Asakawa is the name of professor, uh, and uh, <coughs> so he didn't only talk about bubble. He said both things. Tim Wilsey. Um, yes, thank you very much. Very interesting. So Tim Wilsey from King's College, um, London. So looking back on the sort of 25 years or so when Japan was the number two global economy, uh, do you have any regrets that Japan didn't really manage to sort of? impose itself on the global security architecture, particularly in terms of a United Nations Security Council seat? Uh, very frankly, I think uh, we were doing it, but uh, unsuccessfully. And uh, the first country who uh, agreed with us was, uh, I think it was in 1989, uh, United Kingdom started to support I don't know for what reason, but supported uh, us, and uh, we were jubilant about it. And the uh, U.S. followed, and France followed later. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think uh, Russia and China has supported us yet. And uh, not, if you don't have all the five countries uh, supporting, it will not happen. And uh, I think, uh, but we should continue the effort. Uh, we are. Uh, been doing that with the Germany, France, and Brazil, and India, and those countries for some time, and I think we'll be uh, uh, standing for non-permanent membership next year. But uh, I hope I will do it. Uh, well, sometimes uh, this day will come uh, because <coughs> reason is not because Japan is the number two contributor, but not only that, but uh, it's 70 years after the war. Why only the Winners. Second reason, more important, why only nuclear countries only? You have to tell people 190 countries don't go nuclear. But the, if the managing driver's seat is only a nuclear country, it's very awfully difficult to tell to them that they don't, shouldn't do yeah. So I think uh, for good reasons, I think uh, the door should be open. But uh, it's di difficult. And uh, I think uh, what I think uh, Japan should have done uh, when it was uh, stronger in the economy was uh, what we are doing right now, uh, try structural reform, uh, not to be uh, uh, just to keep into the vested interests, but uh, trying to change the economy. And for example, every th people have uh, their time. You, uh, UK had their time some time ago, maybe uh, coming again, but uh, and built this beautiful land country. U.S. did that too. France did that too. We didn't really, we were uh, spending too much on consumption and we were not doing the enough nation building. That's what I think is the regret I have. I think over the years the United Kingdom <coughs> has also um, supported the permanent seat aspirations of India and, and Brazil. 
and sometimes I do wonder whether this um, apparent enthusiasm is based on a very clear knowledge of the extent of Chinese and Russian resistance. Um, <laughs> I do not comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can, you're not a diplomat. <laughs> Gentlemen, right at the back, please. Thank you. Vinod Kumar, member of the CPTC. Master, can I take you back to the first question that Adam Ward asked you, but why do this? In the context of the Asian period announced by President Obama, I think 18 months ago or two years ago, uh, when some when people in America saw Japan and Australia playing a role alongside the United States to contain the rising military power of China, to which you alluded also. What do you have a message China to, uh, sorry, Japan to play a role in that context? And where does India come into that? Because in this recent visit by Modi, uh, there was also talk about defense cooperation. So what's the nature of that cooperation? How does it fit in with the wider American uh, interest? Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, in short, uh, what uh, Japan would like to see is I said, as I said, uh, a basic status quo not changed by use of force that's the most important thing we are not we are trying to change economically but not security or politics and uh, we are happy with the uh, present uh, uh, country situation we everyone has uh, uh, human rights uh, freedom of speech and uh, uh, I think we are very happy with that. Uh, so I, I do not think Japan want to change the status quo unilaterally or multilaterally. We are not trying to sort of uh, make an alliance with other countries to encircle one country and try to change the status quo. We are happy with what it is, as long as other countries go along with that philosophy. And we hope that will happen. And uh, it's in, I think uh, if I'm right, uh, President Hu Jintao said, uh, I think uh, two years ago or three years ago, three years ago, he said uh, China needs to go to democracy, freedom of speech, more freedom of speech, freedom, free elections. It'll take time, but. Uh, we should be aiming. He's not no more president of China, but I think that kind of aspiration is shared by people because uh, you can't go uh, without that. And I think he admitted that. Uh, I think that's on internet as well. This uh, what he said. A lot of people have noticed a, a real qualitative shift in the nature of the previous Chinese leadership and the, and the current generation of leaders. So with Hu Jintao you had somebody who was part of what was very clearly a collective leadership. He was not considered to be especially charismatic or forceful in his personality, uh, rather cautious on the international scene and in terms of economic reforms at home. Uh, with Xi Jinping, you obviously have somebody with a, a great deal of pedigree and heritage within the Communist Party uh, system, somebody who seems entirely comfortable in his own uh, skin, uh, rather confident, has been shaking things up in terms of the anti-corruption campaign, partly targeted at people who might be sources of resistance to him within the system, uh, and who's also been putting some pointers down with respect to foreign and security policy, the ADIZ, uh, somebody who knows he's going to be around for 10 years if he basically doesn't uh, mismanage things. So do you see the same from Japan, do you see the same qualitative shift in the nature of this leadership and uh, its sense of the degree to which it is vulnerable or not being lessened and I a little bit more keen to flex its, uh, its muscles? I'm not uh, representing Japan anymore, as I said, I'm not no more diplomat. So, my personal view, but my personal view is that uh, if you have one party system and if you, your uh, very objective is to maintain that system uh, anti-corruption or uh, uh, too much uh, freedom of speech or whatever all those things uh, could be a uh, coming from the same cause or uh, aim of trying to maintain the system and uh, I do understand its necessity as well from that standpoint 
So my, my point is that there may not be that big difference as you have just uh, 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 spelled out. Uh, there could be personal differences, uh, uh, strength of differences and all that, but uh, in, in the end, the aim, objective, has to be same. So it's same here as well. You, you want to... Uh, 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 when in the next year's election or you have to do that you, the how to maintain the present system that you have I'm sorry okay. um, so Ramesh Balakrishnan uh, King's College um, in the beginning of your uh, talk you mentioned I think about cyber and space um, I just have two parts of my question the first part is uh, what specific actions are in Japan taking in the cyber realm in particular because of its importance it is importance and the second part of the question is, do you see cyber playing a role in kind of, in some form, impacting the overall security architecture of uh, East Asia sometime in the, in the coming years? Uh, very frankly, I can't uh, answer that question because uh, in this uh, document uh, that just came out a few days ago, it said that uh, we will be uh, focusing on this, but uh, uh, that content is not uh, discussed or mentioned yet, and I don't know how much extent uh, we will be discussing it, but uh, uh, very frankly, uh, my personal assessment is that uh, it's rather difficult to really uh, make a architecture uh, in East Asia or something like that, because uh, knowing that uh, not all the countries are on the same boat, very frankly. They may pretend to be on the same boat, but not in reality. Any further questions? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ambassador. I thought that was very interesting. Um, my name is Richard Bridge. I'm from BP, uh, the oil company, and I had a question about North Korea, uh, which is... Um, uh, which, who do you think best uh, understands uh, North Korea and what its aspirations might be? And the second part of that question is, um, do you have, or does Japan have uh, scenarios of, of what might happen um, as and when the regime uh, comes to an end there and what uh, security threat um, those scenarios might pose to Japan? <coughs> That's a huge question. <laughs> uh, <coughs> who understands North Korea best? Uh, that's very difficult to answer, but uh, I personal, this is my personal view, I think that uh, there's often a uh, mystification of uh, North Korea by themselves and by experts uh, but if you analyze their motives uh, it's not that complicated uh, as I said in those system uh, when you have a system the main objective will be how to maintain the system itself if so from security point of view economic point of view can you really change the basic thinking, uh, for example, open door economy or uh, uh, abandoning uh, the very essence of the security policy or something and change drastically. You know that if you d do that, it's not always that, that you have a better result. So usually these uh, leaders or leadership are very conservative and uh, continue what they can do as long as they can do uh, till the very end and how, when they collapse it's very difficult to predict but uh, usually these things would not happen uh, uh, with uh, some uh, 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 prior signs it uh, happens very ab abruptly so you have to be always uh, careful about those things. Uh, everything that happened in Russia or uh, uh, East Europe or uh, 
Hong Kong today or these things happen abruptly and then have an uh, Arab Spring as well. These things uh, uh, don't really uh, start very slowly. So you have to, it's difficult to predict, I think. And uh, if those things happen, I think it's important uh, that Japan, Republic of Korea, China, United States most, should uh, maintain a, a very close uh, cooperation and uh, uh, of course Russia as well but uh, mainly China, ROK, Japan and US I think have to uh, keep those uh, uh, ties and contacts. Uh, for that I think uh, in a way six party uh, uh, meeting has given a good basis for that. Uh, during Clinton days about 20 years ago they initiated four party talks uh, US uh, China, Korea, and North Korea, excluding Japan. I think that was very silly, and I think to have Japan, Russia in it, is, I think, is more important. Final questions? Yes, please. Um, hello, thank you for your fruitful uh, speech. I'm Chi from uh, Hong Kong and uh, studied in King's College, was uh, was <coughs> department. Um, my question is related to the relationship between. Uh, are you concerned about the situation? <laughs> yes. Um, actually, I was uh, born in Beijing, but spent my life in Hong Kong University, so uh, it's very complicated. You, you, you have friends there? Uh, many of my friends and professors in Hong Kong. I see. Yeah. And uh, no, my question is not related to Hong Kong. I see. Um, yes. My question related to the relationship between domestic politics and international politics, because three years ago, I'll tell you, the issue is very hot in China, both in China and Japan. And there is a very famous like uh, academic assertion in China. Uh, many Chinese scholars said that uh, why it is very hot, because both Chinese government and Japanese government face uh, uh, the big challenge from civil, uh, from domestic civil society. Because, they th because in China at that time now, there is a train crash, very famous train crash. <laughs> crash in southern China, and at that time, uh, there is contradiction between Canton and Beijing. Uh, they have great uh, like challenges to Beijing, and in Japan, that time now there is a uh, like uh, very serious if not economy economy decrease. So that's why some Chinese uh, some Chinese famous scholars they think that this is something about diplomacy. The two governments cooperate with each other to make Dalai Lama issue very hot. So that's why a uh, domestic civil society will transfer their attention from domestic uh, disasters to like foreign uh, confrontation. So, what's your op opinion about this? Uh, this uh, like this such opinion, and it is still hot uh, up to now because whenever there is confrontation between China and Japan, some scholars will think, oh, uh, because the two governments are feared of the civil society. Uh, I was, when I was a government official, and uh, I was facing a rather difficult challenge or issue. When there was some other difficult issue arising, I thought, hey, I'm lucky. Uh, people would not really look at me that much and I uh, will pay attention to that. However, you can't create it. Uh, it, it, it. People may feel that way personally, but I don't think any government or any party can create something and try to make it bigger or whatever. But uh, in psychological basis, yes, uh, some official concern can feel that way. Uh, yeah, but uh, to uh, start from that and uh, make a theory that uh, this was done because of that uh, intentionally and all that is a little too much, I think. A, a final question then. Um, you, you set out very clearly what the Abe agenda and, and program is. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could just say something about the degree to which that is now, as it were, embedded in the political system. To what extent does it attract uh, a consensus? Or is it something that in retrospect might be viewed to be something um, very specific to, to his premiership and something that might transpire to be uh, episodic? Uh, I think uh, in his policy there are some elements which are uh, his personal agenda. 
and uh, some are more uh, uh, general. Uh, it was uh, uh, the Yaskuni issue often was uh, uh, given a lot of attention, but that's not a, what a national <coughs> strategy or anything. That was his personal belief, and uh, uh, so it may change when the leadership may change these things. However, to fortify relations with the United States, go for structural reform, to uh, ameliorate relations with uh, other countries, to uh, contribute. Uh, he claimed, uh, labeled as proactive uh, policy, but uh, we've been uh, number one or number two donor for ODA for such a long time. So all uh, because we are not going to be military power, we would do it by uh, assistance. And that has been the sort of post-war uh, Japan's uh, philosophy. So I don't think that will change. And his idea is based on that, but developing it, and not totally different basis. I think uh, the traditional, his party, Liberal Democratic Party's thinking is to fortify uh, relations with U.S. that would be the uh, basis of deterrence. Second, uh, activate economy through corporations and infrastructures and try to build economy from there on. Uh, that's not from labor union or whatever. That's the uh, his policy, and that has been the thinking of uh, I think uh, a conservative party and. For that, I think uh, it will not uh, evaporate with this uh, uh, change or anything. I think uh, it's uh, deeply rooted. And one important thing is that uh, after two years of his uh, prime ministership, he still enjoys more than 50% of uh, support, which is very rare. And that's one thing is that uh, his uh, economy is reviving under him. I think that's what people appreciate most. And second, he's moving things. He's going around the world, changing education, trying to do things. And I think that's people have been waiting. People have waited too long. I think that's why I think his policy. I'm not uh, here to uh, talk about Abbasan, but uh, for the moment, I think that's uh, uh, the sort of objective uh, sketch of where we are. Well, thank you very much indeed for um, helping us to better understand all of these issues, and thank you for completing a 25-year circle from research associate to research ambassador at the ISS. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, uh,